Welcome back. Another exciting video here today at Bugalo Electronics. Um, what we've got on the bench here is a really nice uh, Marantz 2275 unit. And we're going to be doing a, pretty much a full restoration on this unit. I'll give you a little bit of the backstory. So um, I res had someone respond to a Craigslist ad that I had running, um, you know, wanting to buy vintage electronics or whatnot. And um, they were about 45 minutes away from me up towards the mountains. And uh, they said they had some gear, uh, specifically a, uh, a Heath kit. Uh, I think it was a WM5 or something uh, amplifier. So I, uh, I, I rode up that way to go see it and got there. And uh, they had that amplifier laid out. And they had uh, quite a few other pieces laying there out there on the table that they had for sale. And so uh, this Marantz 2275 was one of those pieces of gear. Uh, really great shape, uh, nice looking unit, uh, just it's all original, never been going through. So I thought, you know what, I will, uh, I'll, uh, I'll take that thing, and I bought it along with some other stuff, kind of made a bundle deal, and uh, and I left. And I brought this home, and I put it on a shelf in the uh, other side of the basement there with a bunch of other, uh, bunch of other vintage '70s receivers and whatnot. And uh, I'm just, I just, you know, like to collect these things. They don't, they don't go down in value, and uh, they're and I sought after and sooner or later someone will want a nice one and, uh, and I'll have one and that's what happened here um, but interestingly the same guy called me back and said hey I'm looking for a high-end Marantz amplifier do you happen to have one and I said well you know I don't have anything uh, I'm really willing, willing to part with other than maybe uh, I've got a uh, I've got a 2275 that I got from you originally and, you know, he said, yeah, hey, I'd be really interested in getting that amp back uh, if it was fully restored. So, you know, I said, uh, sure, why not? So uh, I told him pretty much, you know, remind, remind me what I paid you for it, and uh, and then I'll figure in the cost of the restoration, and uh, you can pretty much have it back at your original cost plus the restoration. So uh, he was happy with that, and uh, he said, go ahead and get busy working on it uh, this week. So that's what I'm doing going to do a, uh, a restore. Um, pretty much, uh, you know, I'll check the dials and lamps and uh, make sure that they, uh, they're they all working. If not, I'll replace them. Um, may put in LEDs. Um, you know, we'll clean and deoxid all the pots here on the front end. I'm going to go through all the boards, like the power supply board down here. Um, you know, this is the uh, preamp board. And I'm going to replace all the, uh, all the electrolytics. Uh, similarly on the output boards here going to replace those and uh, you know just give it a good service overall check the FM uh, tuner alignment and whatnot and uh, just just uh, get the thing in, in top-notch shape so it'll last another 20 years or whatnot so up front out of the gate here as you can see I'm testing the big uh, electrolytic capacitors in it with an ESR meter and they both tested great, extremely low um, equivalent series resistance and uh, about the right capacitance value. So I'm uh, pretty happy that I'm not having to replace those two capacitors. Uh, and I'm pretty sure the customer <laughs> will be too. Those can get a little pricey when you get into that. But um, I'm probably not going to go into great, great detail on every step today. Um, mainly because I've done so many of these Marantzes and made videos on them. But... Uh, but we'll hit the highlights and uh, give you a good sense of what it what you need to do to restore a Marantz 2275. Okay, first on the docket, what I'm going to do, as you can see here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight capacitors here on the power supply board. I'm going to go through and replace every one of those, and it's just as simple as kind of marking and remembering which end the um, the um, you know the negative post is on and coming around here to the other side and unsoldering it um, kind of breaking it loose while holding the capacitor on the other side pulling it out reaching into a bin uh, grabbing a similar part number and putting it back in there and replacing it so we're gonna we're gonna dive into this board at this point point. and if you can see here you know I'm pulling out capacitors like this is uh, 10 microfarads at 50 volts and then I'm just uh, going through my bins here of stuff and digging um, you know these are 50 volt 35 to 100 volt capacitors and these are below 35 volts but I go through until I find a 10 microfarad uh, 50 volt these are 105 degree uh, Nikicon which are really good capacitors and uh, and we then take the capacitor that's half the size of the original one <laughs> 
um, but the exact same value and we go insert it into the amplifier. And about 20 to 25 minutes later um, we've replaced all these capacitors on the power supply board. Um, none of them look bad. Um, you know, I could go through and test them, but here's the reality. Um, if anything's going to go out in, these, in this amplifier, um, either now or in the next 5 or 10 years, it would be these power supply capacitors or some of the capacitors here on the output board. So, um, you know, I want to go ahead and do a full restoration and get those things replaced. Let me show you a trick I do. Um, I may have shown you this before, but before I start, I go through and I put a little black tick on every single capacitor in here. You'll see wherever it was mounted. And I always put the little tick facing the front of the amplifier. That way, once I pull this part out and I'm sitting there looking at the value and then I'm trying to decide how it goes back in, well, all i got to do is hold it over here and orient it towards, you know, towards the front here. Um, and then instantly I know, oh, the stripe goes up on that capacitor. Because I have found boards before that were marked wrong. But I always like to check the board and the polarity markings there as well. But uh, it's just another safety thing I do. And then uh, if you'll notice after I've replaced them, I come along and put a little red mark on the top of every one of them. Um, that tells me that they've uh, been replaced at that point. So um, got this board done. Now we're going to move on to the, uh, to the two output boards at this point. Okay, before I jump on off the power supply board, if you'll notice, I've hooked this thing up and I'm playing music through it. Uh, let me tell you why. I like to um, repair a section and then test. Repair a section and then test. Repair a section and then test. Let me tell you why. Let's say you rebuilt this power supply, you rebuilt this output board, you rebuilt this output board, you push the power button and you blow a fuse. Uh-oh. <laughs> you don't know where to go look at that point. I mean, honestly, you could... Uh, it could be anywhere. And, and you could have put a capacitor in backwards over here. You could have shorted something when you soldered over here. Could have been over here on this board. Could have been on this board. You wouldn't know where to start. So you'd have to troubleshoot a lot of things. So um, I highly recommend do one little section at a time. At least then if you know if you've got a problem, you, you're isolated to where you just finished uh, touching last. So uh, that old uh, adage of, uh, you know, what's broken, well, what changed last, well, that would help you with that. Uh, I think sounds great, though. I'll show you one of the things I really like about the 2275. Um, if you'll notice, I just removed these four screws right here. One, two, and then there's two more. Um, three, four, right? And um, uh, let me flip it over and I'll show you real quick. Okay, now on the back side you can see here, you just got a couple modular plugs right here. This one and this one. And this whole output board then comes right out. I mean, you could not get it any simpler than that. The 2275 does that. I believe the 2270, uh, I want to say uh, 22, uh, can't remember the other model number, but if it's pure amplifier, no, uh, no, um, no stereo. I mean, uh, no FM tuner to it. I've seen do that as well. You, know, you get into like a 2238, 2235. Some of those things are just a royal pain because these connections are not plugs. They're uh, they're connections all along the sides here. 2245s like that, and you have to unsolder those things way up in there, um, or they're tie wrap. I mean, uh, wire wrap like this just really ugly it takes you know an hour to get each side out and I'll work on I'll have this the whole side out in uh, probably three minutes or so check it out I, all I did was unplug those two core um, connectors on the bottom side and check this out the entire amplifier board comes out just like that amazing um, you can see that was all it was those two plugs these four screws right here and um, now it's just as simple as, um, you know, i got to replace a couple capacitors, uh, one, two on each board here, and uh, three actually. And we'll have each of these things uh, rebuilt. And check out how easy it is to service this board. Four screws here, um, one, two, three, four on each corner, really simple little Phillips that come out. Then you got to flip the thing up, and there's a screw right here that you take loose that holds this bracket in place. 
once you do that, look at this, the whole thing just folds down. Never had to disconnect the uh, power transistors. Um, you can easily get to the back of the capacitors here to unsolder them. And uh, man, it couldn't get any simpler than this to service. Uh, you can get a 2275, um, highly recommend it. Your service engineer will love you for it. Hmm. Just remove this capacitor right here. If you'll notice it is a, uh, turn around here so you can read it, 16 volts at 47 microfarads. And I have some uh, 16 volts at 47 microfarads and Kikon capacitors. And if you'll notice they're about a third of the size of this one was originally. But I also have some 47 volt uh, microfarad at 50 volts, so three times the voltage rating. And it's still smaller than this one. I'm going to go ahead and put in the 50 volt. Um, It'll just run a lot cooler and uh, you know last a lot longer. Um, it is a much higher rated capacitor, so uh, why wouldn't I? All right, um, one, two, three caps replaced. Um, we will be rebiasing this amplifier as we get it uh, put back together. It's a simple matter now of uh, drop that thing back down in there, put the four screws in place, plug the two. Uh, plastic connectors back on and jump to the other side. As I'm getting ready to put these long, you know, I gotta go way down in here with a long screwdriver and put a screw in here somewhere that I can't get my fingers into. I'll show you another little tip. Um, if you don't have one of these really nice little things, uh, why I make some. Um, you got a magnetized side and a demagnetized side, and you can just uh, run your screwdriver around in here, especially on the tip. And then all of a sudden, you, uh, you're picking up screws really easily. You can put them on there, drop it down in there. And, uh, and if you ever find you don't like your screwdriver magnetized for whatever reason, you can run it around on the other side and it will demagnetize it. Uh, just another tip. Um, got the board mounted in there now with the four screws. It was simple enough. And uh, I've got these two connectors. One thing I like to do, um, I'll spray a little bit of deoxid D5 down into the... Uh, into these connectors here and uh, a little bit on these just so that uh, so that um, you know there's no corrosion building up or anything like that all right as you can see uh, finished this module what am I doing I'm testing it making sure that it's playing good uh, before moving on to the next module because if I had some kind of problem I would want to troubleshoot it here versus uh, having to troubleshoot the whole thing and I got into the first capacitor on this board, and uh, it's a 16 volt, 10 microfarad. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see the end here is wet. Um, this thing's actually been leaking. So uh, good thing we went to this trouble, or this thing would have caused, uh, caused something bad here pretty soon. All right, so testing again. I can already tell the base is tighter on this thing, um, less sloppy. At any rate, um, got this output board recapped, got this output board recapped, um, got the power supply recapped. I'm going to hit the uh, preamp board, then we're going to bias this thing, then we'll kind of get to the, the cosmetic side of things. This is the preamp board, it's underneath. Um, you can see here it's got a couple capacitors on it um, that I'd like to replace. Um, it's got two screws, one down here at the bottom, one down here at the bottom. And then on this end, they're really not screws. These are studs. Um, and you have to use a quarter inch nut driver here and uh, put it on these uh, on these things and then they'll spin right off. And uh, might have to cut a few uh, wire straps loose, but you can get this thing off far enough to, uh, to unsolder these capacitors and replace them. Yeah, I got two of the three, replaced them on the third one on the uh, preamp board. And if you notice, 35 volts, 100 microfarads, and uh, I happen to have some spray, really good. 100 microfarad, 100 volt. Um, actually, exact same size, um, three times the voltage rating. So guess what we're going to go with? And we got the new board back in. Uh, two new capacitors here, the new spray here. Uh, looking good. Sounding great. Um, I'll just mention one other thing here that 
One thing I have replaced in the past sometimes are these. If you see way down in here, you'll see a capacitor that I'm putting my finger on. It's the um, coupling capacitors on the outputs here. But um, I found that rarely these things are bad. Um, they weren't the old, uh, you know, paper and oil type or anything that would dry out. Um, so I think these, uh, I think they hold up pretty well over time, and uh, I think they uh, they actually sound pretty good. So only if I'm having a problem do I ever replace those. So I guess we've rebuilt most of everything I'm wanting to recap at this point. Um, now I'm wanting to dive into some of the cosmetics on this thing. You'll notice here on the front. Um, let me turn the power on here. A little bit of something on the inside of the dial here. If you notice, um, most of the lights here behind this are uh, illuminating. I can tell there's one bulb burnt out around right along in here. Uh, maybe one right along in here. And the uh, you know, the blue here behind these things are just a little dim. So uh, I think we're going to do this one up with uh, blue LEDs all the way across to uh, give it a really nice fresh look and uh, you know, just making sure all that the uh, the bulbs are doing what they should do. Tape one, tape two ops. Looks like maybe the phono light is out here. If you'll notice I've got FM, I've got AM, I've got no phono, I've got auxiliary, tape one, tape two here. Um, so I'll have to check on that bulb as well. Onward we go. I'm going to pull the face off. i uh, just use a uh, nut driver to get these. They're 3 8 inch on each of the corners here. We'll pull the knobs. There's always a, uh, a nut behind one of these knobs holding the face on. But once we get that out, we'll dive into this thing pretty well. One thing I like about this amp is I think I'm the first person to ever uh, remove the face plate. I might be the first person that's ever even serviced this thing. It looks pretty all original. but. One thing I've had to do to get these knobs off is the old spoon trick. Two spoons like this, you get them right in behind here um, on both sides of the knob, and you pry evenly all the way up against the shaft with the tip of the uh, with the tip of the spoons, and uh, your knob will come off, and you will not have scratched or damaged your uh, your face plate if you've never seen the spoon trick work. The other thing was uh, this little knob here that screws in here on this. It was tight, couldn't move it. Um, I ended up having to take a little screwdriver here and get it, you can see here, on the notch like this. And then uh, I ended up having to tap the head of it a little bit with a uh, small hammer to get that thing moving around. And then, uh, then it came right up. Just thought I would show you that. As soon as I get these four knobs off here uh, on the corners, this thing will come right off. And off came the face plate. You can see some stuff here on the dial I'm going to have to clean. It's on the inside, a little bit of gunk. But this face plate is in beautiful shape. Oh, no scratches to speak of. Um, things really nice. Now I can actually get in here and uh, get this uh, get this dial off and uh, you know get a new piece of vellum cut. Uh, the whole nine yards, get, uh, get the bulbs replaced. We're going to dive on in there and do that. Uh, and, and while I've got this uh, front off, it makes it really easy to get in here and deox all these pots as well. I actually like to deox the pots before I clean the dial and whatnot, just in case. Because uh, I have done this, get it all done, spray in here to deox the pots, and somehow a speck gets up here. And then you, um, it's just easier to get the, uh, the pots out of the way first. Let me show you about deoxing the pots on this thing right here. Um, First and foremost, <coughs> sorry about that, lost my voice. First off, you can get to these pots. On, this is the volume knob. It's mounted right here. You can get in here to spray in, right? This is the selector knob down here. You can get in here to spray. The treble, bass, mid, um, uh, selector, um, the uh, roll-off selector here, you can't get in here to spray these. You can't get to them from the top. You can't get to them from the bottom. What's got to happen here is these four knobs, um, the nuts here, have got to be removed. And then you have to take this board. You have to loosen these little connectors right here that hold this board in place. And then you have to disconnect this little um, connector right here. And you have to remove this board. Once you got the board removed, you can get in there to spray and get those things really good and clean. 
I've seen people try to, you know, work their little uh, rubber, I mean, uh, red, red hose end here, you know, on the deoxid down in there, but you just can't do a quality job, to be honest. So um, we're going to get that thing off. What you need to do that with is you need a, uh, a long shaft socket here that's 7 sixteenths in size, and this is just a small little craftsman set. And you basically get that thing over top, um, and you know it'll break loose. There it goes, and uh, you can see the nut'll uh, start coming off. Once you get that off, get the brackets out the back, then this whole board just pulls right out. Um, you can't use a nut driver for this. I've got a uh, I'll keep a seven sixteenth inch nut driver over here. You could actually use the nut driver on the uh, on the uh, the pot up here with the volume, but the uh, the multi section uh, pots here the shafts are too big for uh, most nut drivers uh, to fit over top of so end up having to use a small 7 16 cent socket okay as you can see I've removed all four nuts and washers here on this front I've now uh, pulled these little tabs back don't pull them too far they'll break but just snap them back just a hair and then uh, this little plug will unplug and I've also removed these brackets that were mounted right here with four screws that help hold uh, help hold this board in place. Once you've done that, um, a little bit of wiggling here and there. Uh, it might take me a minute, but um, hang on, I know I need both hands. I had to remove this one little uh, standoff that was here on the preamp board. It was getting in the way. Um, that I had just put back on as I replaced the preamp board. But once you get that, then this whole thing, look at it, breaks loose. The entire whole thing comes out. And guess what? There's some capacitors on here. <laughs> guess what that means? We're going to replace these as well. Just uh, part of recapping this entire whole amplifier. Um, I want to make sure this thing's right and lasts many years for the customer. So. Uh, and clean these things, recap these, uh, and then we can get that thing back in here and get to the uh, the dialing glass. All right. Well, uh, you know, cut a little time out of this video. I didn't show the recapping, but we've got that thing uh, recapped, and we uh, we also deox. You know, the uh, the controls really good. Same with this switch here, as well as the uh, the volume knob up here. Got them all cleaned up. Got this uh, connection plugged back in right now, and uh, we're ready to flip this thing over and get going on the dial at this point. Oops, just realized I've got this one piece here that goes back into the preamp board I gotta put on. Okay, to get into the face of this thing, there's two screws, one here and one here, that hold this little black bar that goes across in place. And uh, once you get it, you can pull that bar off just like this, you can see. Um, and then you really have nothing at that point holding this uh, this black face plate in place other than some some glue going around it. So I'm um, going to show you how to uh, how to get this uh, face off. Um, we will have to lift the dial indicator off up here, otherwise it'll get in the way. As you can see, kind of got it propped up and out of the way. And we'll end up cleaning up all this old grease and putting some new grease on it here in a little bit. But the next next test at hand is to get this uh, black faceplate pried loose right here. Okay, the only way I know how to describe getting this faceplate off to you is one word. Slowly. If you'll notice I've stuck a screwdriver here and I pried just a little bit in the corner and got it behind it. And you can hear this stuff as you start prying on it. Um, eventually you can get your fingers behind it. But what you want to do is just go slowly. You go fast, you'll end up breaking this thing very very slowly all the way across you might have to work your screwdriver along as you go it's kind of tough to do with uh with one hand here but that's how you slowly go across and get this whole thing off and slowly but surely you can see it came off and yes you can see the old vellum paper tore here look how yellowed that stuff is um it's why the back it's why the face plate's so so dingy and dim so um, we're going to have to get all that off and we're going to have to kind of use a screwdriver or something to scrape all this glue off around it. And we'll end up peeling this off all the way around. But, um, you know, your lights have to shine through this dingy yellow. I wish you could see how dingy and yellow it is. It's, uh, it's pretty bad. We're going to put some new vellum paper on here, white, uh, clear. 
that will help it uh, look much much better and we now look at this we can get in here easily to these bulbs we can check out all these bulbs in here and uh, <coughs> I've still come in from behind on these but uh, you get the gist of what we're up to here okay believe it or not all the bulbs were good in it just a couple of them are not as bright as they uh, once were and uh, got both the uh, the lights here but I'm gonna still replace these with some LEDs they'll uh, then they'll last forever okay to get in here to the bulbs behind the meters I had to take two screws out one right here and one right here um, from there this little guide arm here was screwed down right here I unscrewed it and just kind of swung it out of the way here and then I had to pull this uh, plate off the uh, FM section here it's four screws that uh, you can see they go one two three four on each corner there and once you pull that out then you can uh, kind of get in here to lay this thing back down and actually pull this thing out to get to the bulbs now if you notice what I've got here are uh, 8 volt LED Marantz um, blue. Yeah, they come, these come in clear and blue. And you'll see what I mean by blue here in a minute. And I've got an 8 volt um, 40 milliamp Marantz um, little grain of wheat bulb that will go up in here and replace the, uh, the FOMA one that's not working. I'll have to get to that and uh, replace it. Okay, I've replaced the bulb in here that goes to the uh, to the phono light, but to get to it, you have to remove these two screws. There's one right here and one right here. When you do this little strip along here, will just pull back out, and then you can get right in there and solder the bulb. If you're trying to push the bulb all the way from the front here through the two little holes that it takes to solder it into the back of this board, it's really tough to get to, really hard to see. So it's easier just to remove those two screws there and. Uh, Pull the panel off the back. This is the little board for the um, the panel, the lights behind the uh, the meters. And if you notice, it is important on these to somewhat get these things. See, I've got them pointed straight forward. Because um, if you look at one of these, the LED bulbs, they have uh, they have a front side and a back side here. So the front side has the three little lights on it. And then the back side just has some circuitry. But it's very important that you point those three things straight forward where you want them. Because they are, it's kind of like a flashlight. They are a little bit directional there. But we'll, uh, we'll get that slid back in here. And then we'll get around to putting the bulbs in the front here. And as you can see, the FOMO bulb's working now. Check these out. <laughs> Bro glowing beautifully blue. Um, and still playing. Um, FM Ox. Sounding great. Let's finish getting the bulbs in this thing. All right. Uh, looks like stadium lighting here. <laughs> but they are seriously bright and blue. We'll get uh, get some new vellum on this thing and uh, keep rolling with it. I'm pretty happy with it so far. At this point we're going to lay this thing down on a towel. You don't want it to get scratched and you're going to... I'm using just a small little flat screwdriver and I'm working my way around and I'm basically just peeling up this old vellum and getting it off of this... Uh, getting it off this thing. It comes off pretty easily. Uh, it's not too bad. And once you get all this off then... Uh, then it'll be time to glue a new piece down. Alright, here you go. You can jump on eBay. And you can pay $7.45 for two little thin sheets of vellum enough to do two Marantz units. Um, or, let me give you another idea. Or, you can go on to Amazon or many other places. I got this off somebody from Etsy. Any rate, right there is a sheet of 48 weight vellum. Um, as you can see, you can almost see through it. Um, you can see my hand behind it here, but you can't really. Anyway, I bought a pack of 100 sheets for $13 shipped. So, uh, just shop around a little bit and uh, it will uh, work out well for you, I promise. So what I did was just uh, 
Just a little bit of contact cement around each of the edges here. Glued this vellum down as a whole sheet like this. Left it on here. Flip it over then. Um, what I'm doing is I laid this thing down and I've got a handy dandy just little uh, this little empty cutter. Really super nice little uh, cutters. You can get these on Amazon. I'd highly recommend one. Great for uh, speaker refoaming as well. All right, just uh, using it and uh, coming and cutting along right at the edge here. I'm not going to do it, but you can see I've already cut this. I've already cut this part loose, and it uh, trimmed perfectly there. Now, when you're done, you can see here you got a nice little cutout. I'll put that back in my stack of uh, vellum. Flip it over and look. Nice and glued onto the other side. And uh, now I got to do is clean this side of the glass and. Uh, little bit of just a little bitty bit of contact cement again on this back side around and we're going to glue this thing up in here and uh, should be set to go then all right we've got it all glued back in got the uh, black rail here it's kind of the dust card on both sides uh, off and you want to make sure you wipe off any remnants of uh, you know paper towel flakes or anything on here because once you kind of seal this thing up in behind the um, in behind the glass, then whatever's there is there. So let's see what this thing takes, looks like now. Oh wow! Check it out. Beautiful. Nice and blue, bright as could be. Love it. All right, let's get a. See, I deoxed this a minute ago. Didn't show you that. And uh, I'm going to clean the, uh, the flywheel here on the uh, FM. I'm going to clean the... Clean the uh, see this whole track up here? See how it's got brown? That's the old grease. And uh, what I always do is I clean this out as much as I can. Because this little thing here actually travels on this rail. And this rail here has... Uh, all this brown gook on it that we don't want anymore. Um, once we get this cleaned off, then I use over here some uh, super lube. It's a PTFE synthetic grease that I'll put on this. And it doesn't take but just a little bit. And you can rub it back and forth then and uh, create a nice little uh, nice little grease surface there that'll last for many, many years. But like I say, I rub this thing a good bit make sure I get off all the old and on both sides of this rail here as well. As you can see I'm rubbing here on the back side because that rail is uh, what this thing here actually runs on uh, back and forth. You can see here about how much I put on here. I mean it's just a light little and then I'll just start kind of smoothing it out here. Same as on this track rail here on both sides of it. I'll get both sides greased up a little bit and that'll help this uh, That'll help the uh, dial indicator slide uh, just move back and forth freely. Okay, up next I'll use just a little bit of what they call electronics lubricant. It's a lubricant that's uh, safe to use on electronics, safe to use on plastics. And anywhere like right here, one of the guides for the, uh, the guides for the, uh, for the string on the uh, tuner section. I'll just give it a slight little squirt like that and I'll do the same down here. Uh, kind of hard to see, but I'll do the same on the uh, the bearings for the uh, this thing on top and bottom. Basically, lubricate the whole uh, path for the cord here on the tuner, and then I'll also get down in here into the tuner itself, and um, it's the air variable capacitor here, and I'll I'll oil the bearings a little bit with this stuff so that uh, this, this thing turns quite easily. Okay, now what I'm doing is I'm cleaning the uh, like the flywheel, I'm getting ready to clean all these knobs here. I'm gonna clean these knobs, and I use uh, I like this Mr. Clean stuff with Febreze built into it. it. Does a really good job of cleaning. They also sell this in a you know in a non-squirt form. Sometimes I'll put that in a bucket with half and half with water, and uh, if these things are really bad and soak them, these are not bad at all. So I'm not gonna soak them. You always you always run the risk when you soak them. Um, breaking the glue loose down in here. So since they're not bad at all, I'm just going to wipe them down with some of this spray, Mr. Clean. Okay, I've done the same here on this uh, face plate. Sprayed it down with the Mr. Clean. I used uh, just a plain old toothbrush here and kind of scrubbed it up real good and uh, wiped it down 
wiped it down well with uh, paper towels. Then I uh, sprayed the front and the back of the glass um, with um, Windex. And I usually come along then like with a uh, you know cloth or something like a jeweler's cloth like this and uh, try to clean it up really good in the corners because uh, if you use a paper towel you always leave these little white remnants of paper towels. Um, so I try to get that cleaned up really well and uh, I still see some more down this way but I'll drop the camera and finish cleaning it up and uh, stick this thing on. Now it's just a matter of uh, getting these four screws on the 3 8 inch aluminum one thing I'll tell you is try to use a, uh, a nut driver or something with a really smooth edge right here around it. I see a lot of units where somebody used a pair of pliers or something else right here on these nuts and when they tighten them down and get done you see these swirl marks around the uh, around the aluminum knobs where they uh, so yeah, I'll tighten them down. I try not to push too hard forward. I try to keep most of the pressure on the nut versus uh, versus pushing forward onto the aluminum plate and that'll uh, that'll help with uh, keeping from getting any of the swirl marks on there but man that's about one of the cleanest um, ranch units I have seen in a long long time beautiful unit um, glad to have had, had it in my collection for a while and uh, even more happy that it's going to a good home there she is back together let's see what we get now uh, let's see. Man. There it goes. Sounding great. Um, FM's a little tough down here in my basement. Every once in a while I can get a signal. But we're going to check out. I'm going to hook it up to a FM uh, antenna and uh, check out the FM section real quick. Okay, the good news is I'm going to, uh, you know, the FM uh, section turned out quite well. It's playing quite well. I use a little uh, Turk indoor antenna. just plugs in the back and uh, kind of move that around as need to to get a signal down here in the basement. Really what's left at this point is the biasing of the two outputs. Um, here, 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 here. One of these is the idle. Um, and the off one's the idle, one's the offset. Okay, I went to high, I went to Google, typed in Marantz 2275 service manual. It took me to Hi-Fi Engine. I downloaded this PDF of their service manual. In here, it will quickly show you how to bias this thing. First thing you do is uh, go to the power supply and make sure the output voltage is right. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to um, connect across both of the outputs and get rid of any DC offset on the outputs. In other words, across the speaker terminals, zero volts coming out. Then you're going to set the idle current on this thing um, using a set of instructions here um, so that you're reading 10 millivolts across a certain set of test points, which equates to 25 milliamps of idle current. You're going to do that on both sides, and that's what you're going to do to bias this thing. I'm going to show you the quick version of this because I've got another video out there. Um, I'm rents, I think it was a 1030 that I did, or 1060 that I did, um, complete detailed bias instructions. This will be a, a quick version, but it'll at least get you up to speed on what you need to know. Okay, I'm going to give you the one minute version of biasing this thing on the power supply here. Ground one lug to chassis. Go down here to R or J804 right there. You can see I've got the lead clicked to it. It's just a little wire sticking through. You want to adjust that for roughly 35 volts. And that potentiometer right here is what you adjust to change that. And 35.3 is close enough. Uh, things really touchy and uh, you move it just a little bit and you got 34. Move it the other way and you got 36. So 35.3 there is close enough on that. Next step. Up next, on the speaker lug terminals, connect the negative end of your DC voltmeter onto the ground and your positive one onto the positive output for, let's say, the right channel. And then you will come over here and what you're trying to adjust is R741 right here. Um, you want to adjust this potentiometer until this is at zero. So basically what you want is zero volts on the output going to your speaker terminals. 
And I'm going to call that about a zero as zero gets. That's 0, 0.000 volts. You do the exact same thing on the other side. Um, you move these jumpers right over here to the other two speaker connections. And then you'll come over here to this one and adjust R741 right down here, the bottom one. And as you can see, with that connected, I've adjusted this one there again, 0. 0.000 volts on the output. Okay. And the final step, you'll have to flip the amp upside down, as you can see here. And on the board here, there is J703 and J704. It will be the purple wire and the yellow wire on this amp, at least. Or it's the two to the two in the series of four here. It's the two closest to the inner or the two closest to this connector. You connect across that, and then you gotta, you're going to want to adjust um, R742 right here, the upper one. Remember how this one was further down inside the upper one here? You're going to want to adjust that for point or for um, 10 millivolts. So 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. 10 milli, 10 millivolts here, and that side is biased. So let me flip these over to the other side, and uh, we'll see if we can. Uh, same two connections up here on the top of the amp. If you notice, we're sitting at uh, 11 millivolts. Don't worry about the positive or negative sign. It just means I got the lead on the wrong one. And then you come around up here, and remember 742, the outer one. Notice how this one's pushed further in. 742 right here. And we're going to adjust this puppy for uh, 10 millivolts. We are biased, my friend. That is what is involved in biasing a Marantz 2275. From an electrical standpoint at this point, from a tuning, a cleaning standpoint, pretty much done with this thing. I'm going to take it in the other room and uh, put the case on it. But uh, sounding great. Uh, I ran it through the scope and the uh, distortion meter and the spectrum analyzer and this thing's within spec. It all, it all came out well. Um, you can watch other videos I have and see me uh, use that gear if you wanted to. But uh, let's get this over in the other room and get the case on it. Okay, one thing I did when I got this thing, the uh, cover on it was in... Uh, pretty rough shape. It had been scratched up pretty bad. So I uh, took it over to my buddies here at Landmark Coatings and I uh, had them powder coat the top black. It turned out really well. But um, somewhere along the way I've lost the original screws. But uh, I buy these things in packs of 50. Uh, they sell both the top and cover and side screws as well as the uh, screws that would go on the bottom cover. And uh, the company here is um, amkproducts.com. Um, so if you're ever looking for Marantz screws, uh, they got them pretty cheap, and uh, we're going to get those things put in here. And there she is, in her beauty. Nice, beautiful black case. You can see it's kind of glossy. Um, one thing, when you get something powder coated like this, I found if you put some uh, wax on it, just like you're waxing a car, it'll turn out really well. I haven't done to this that on this one. I'll probably tell the customer and let him wax it. But um, it's a really simple process, and uh, this thing turned out really nice. I'm happy with it uh, all the way around. Really nice, clean unit, and uh, you know, imagine on eBay, this would be one of those somebody would have up there for $999 uh, buy it now, and uh, sooner or later it would sell because it's in that kind of shape. But, um, you know, the restoration I did today, I started at 4 a.m. this morning, and uh, here it is. Um, 1201 right now so um, what is that eight hours is what I've got into it at this point it's a pretty good day's worth of work there <laughs> um, don't let anybody ever think tell you that this stuff is simple and quick and can be done in one or two hours um, certainly making the video probably adds an extra 15 30 minutes here or there but um, uh, not not greatly um, any rate, everybody, going to wrap this video up. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you liked how this thing turned out and the way it looks and sounds. And uh, I'm actually going to go load it up in my car. I'm meeting the customer here in about a half an hour um, over in Winston-Salem for them to pick it up. Uh, they're pretty excited about it as well. 
Thanks again everybody and uh, stay tuned, we'll have more coming.